Hey there, Asset Horizon fans. I'm happy to present another installment of our series, Inner Experience. This is a show where we connect philosophy to other research areas, in particular, things like psychology and mysticism. If you are new to listening to Acid Horizon or Inner Experience, I would really advise that you check out our show with Andy from Kayina on Carl Jung and his research on the phenomenon of UFOs. The episode you are about to hear involves discussion of psychological issues and suicide, so please be aware of that. At the end of the episode, I make a full self-disclosure in the form of a dream that I had many years ago. In any event, shall we begin? Inner Experience This is your inner experience. Today, we have a very interesting episode ahead of us. We have invited someone who goes by the name of The Stranger. The Stranger is a psychoanalyst, and they are here to answer all of our questions, not only about psychoanalysis, but also they will do a little bit to explain about the juncture between psychoanalysis and what Deleuze and Gattari call schizoanalysis. And we will cap off this discussion by talking about dream work and the methodology of the psychoanalyst. So the next best thing to do is allow the stranger to introduce themselves. Who are you, stranger? I'm DC Barker Tick on Twitter, and I couldn't even tell you what my at is because it's just a bunch of random letters and numbers I assign myself. I'm training to be a psychoanalyst. And I'm a psychotherapist. I have a private practice and I work in a hospital with people whose, you know, mental illness. And I kind of put that in inverted commas because, you know, that's a kind of loaded term affects their physical health and they have to be hospitalized. So my kind of level of care is kind of like a halfway house almost. Felix Guattari, no surprise, is probably my favorite thinker. And uh, I pull from him a lot in my work with these folks and the regular psychoanalytic kind of itinerary there as well. I think a first important question would be, what was the road to becoming a psychoanalyst like? Also, what was that nascent impulse of, okay, I think I want to become a psychoanalyst like as well? And maybe you can also talk about some important moments in the development of your discipline as you learned. Yeah, good question. I grew up with psych, uh, psychology books all around the house, so my interest in that uh, was aroused pretty early. I always knew I wanted to do something that was in the helping profession. Um, so as a kid, I always thought I want to be a, a psychologist. I want to be a child psychologist to help people. So that was like the superficial uh, kind of content. Um, then I, I went to undergrad, and you find out that a psychologist isn't someone who really sits and talks with people and helps them out. And that's nothing against psychologists, but they're someone who really runs tests and uses kind of like these indexes of medical jargon to, to kind of label people. Um, so I said, well, I really want to work with people. So at that point you can be like a teacher, a social worker or a psychotherapist. So I did the social work psychotherapy line I actually met a really cool teacher in my undergrad who actually taught at a psychoanalytic institute. And he said, I think you could be a good candidate. He actually helped me get in there. And the kind of the rest was history. I guess on a more conceptual line, you know, what piqued me, what what piqued my interest in that was uh, the the idea that it's supposed to be a depth psychology. Um, uh, You know, undergrad, I double majored in developmental psychology and philosophy. And if there's two like subfields that are going to link right up with psychoanalysis. It's those two. That's really the big split in the field is people who look at it as like this kind of positivistic developmental, like you're reparenting people basically very edipal. And then the the more like Lacanian or schizoanalytic side, which is a lot more philosophical. So I kind of had that, that, you know, I want to help people and I'm into philosophy. What am I going to do with philosophy? If I don't want to be a teacher, I'll uh, be, be a psychoanalyst. 
So how did you land on the idea of specifically becoming a psychoanalyst versus, let's say, uh, an existential therapist or some other f- modality? I think chance. Um, it's not a fun answer, but I think it's the real one. I met this fellow uh, at a time in my life where I lacked direction myself. And I think he guided me towards something that my skill set at the time readily kind of latched onto. And I said, this is what I want to do. There is a more complicated answer in there and that the cliche with like why anyone gets into a helping profession or becomes a psychoanalyst is that in, in curing others, and again, curious and kind of mock quotes, you're trying to cure something in yourself. And I don't think I realized that at the time, but you know, going through my own analysis and looking back on that, I realized, wow, everything I was trying to figure out in my, as a professional And everything I was trying to give other people are pretty much the things I lacked in my life that I was trying to give myself um, vicariously through others. So, yeah, the the wounded healer archetype of the of the practitioner, right? Yeah, exactly, and uh, it's pretty true. Um, uh, You know, do you see this reflected in in other people that you work with professionally, like alongside with? Absolutely. you know, and, and this is why I always stay anonymous is because I have a colleague and I love them so much and they're great, but I know that they had some conflicts with their mother, mm. real substantial emotional conflicts, not just kind of made up Oedipal BS. Um, and this, this, uh, the, this colleague of mine, whenever they're working with a family uh, at our hospital, they always end up putting a lot of effort into excluding any extra therapists and almost creating extra tension between the mother and the child um, by, by digging more than maybe she needs to. Mm. So she's a great worker and she does a ton of great work, but that is what we would call probably a counter-transference resistance. So counter-transference is like when something is aroused in you by the patient and it's something you haven't analyzed thoroughly in yourself. So it actually blocks you from being able to help someone. Um, So she's trying to heal perhaps her own mother in this moment of doing this kind of thing with excluding people. It actually ends up acting out and not being helpful. So a a long answer for your question, Will, but it's a really good question that's pertinent psychoanalysis. So definitely, yes. Yeah. I think the one experience that I probably share with you is that I toyed with the idea of perhaps becoming a psychoanalyst at one time. I I was immersed in the literature, and I know we've kind of gone back and forth online, you know, comparing notes on Jung and Freud, Mm -hmm. you know, just as we most recently did. And as I understand it, you know, the road to becoming a psychoanalyst involves several hours of analysis yourself. I've actually had, well, I I don't know, I could probably count all the hours of analysis that I've had on my fingers and toes, but what was that like (laughs) for you? Um, Like, when did you start? What does that road look like? How do you know that you're making progress? What's the mentorship like inside the analysis itself? Maybe you could say a few interesting things about that. Yeah, I will. And I have a really good dream that I'll share with you all in the process. Sure. Because I know we kind of got here through like dreams. Um, Yeah. So when I started my master's program, uh, you start analysis right away and they call it a training analysis because it's it's supposed to, yes, analyze you, but also help you become an uh, an analyst yourself. So it's different than if you were to just pick someone out of the phone book and go to them. The, the tra- training analysis they have in mind that you're new and that you want to do this. So from the start, the transference is coded with a little bit of that interaction in mind. So I started my master's, which was a three-year program, but I did it in two because I was really dedicated. And then the doctoral program, the fastest you can do it is five. Some people take 10. So I'm on track to complete it in five, five and a half. I'm in my last year. So I've been in analysis for about seven years. After the first two years, I joined a group analysis, and I recently left that just because my schedule can't accommodate it. So I've been in individual analysis for seven years, and I was in group analysis for about uh, four years. Um, my my journey along the way, geez, like how could I recapitulate all that? Um, well, I'll tell you, when I went there, I was a real 
probably someone people didn't really want to spend time around. Very reactive, much more defensive. Mm. I couldn't, I, if you had asked me, I had the idea that I could understand other people's perspectives, but I could only understand it through my own lens. A lot of people think, oh no, I get them. I get the other side, but you only get your idea of the other side, which is kind of one way of understanding Lacan's cryptic message. Uh, there is no sexual relationship and that mm. we have an idea of the other person and it's our idea of their idea of themselves. Mm. <laughs> that sounds way more complicated than it is, but just how subjectivity works. But anyways, I had a real victim narrative, like, you know, the world's a hostile place and, uh, there's nothing I can do about it and like all that kind of stuff. And I had a really impactful dream. Uh, and Winnicott has a name for this kind of dream, but I forget it right now. But somewhere around the two or three year mark, which is consistent with the research that says around two or three years is when you really see the shift in analysis. I had this dream where I went, to, all my bullies from middle school and high school were in a giant line, like all the way down out of perspective, you know, like you see in mm -hmm. those kind of, kind of like uh, horror movies or whatever. Okay. And uh, I went down the whole line and I shook each and every one's hand. And I said, I said, even though it was painful, I, I understand why you did that to me now. And I said that to each and every one of them. And I woke up and in my body, I actually felt a sense of relief. Hmm. Like I woke up with goosebumps and I let out a big sigh. And ever since then, I've actually been different. And it's not mystical. It's not like this transcendental thing in my spirit or whatever. I'm, I will always tell the line that psychoanalysis is a materialist uh, practice. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I was working a lot with kids at this time in schools. That Before I worked at the hospital, I worked in a school. And I was working with a lot of kids who were getting bullied. And I really felt for these kids. And my work was, you know, part analytic, but part social work, just trying to like help this kid get through his day without getting bullied. And I had the thought once, you know, I can see why this kid would get bullied. Mm -hmm. People could easily pick on this kid. He does a lot of provocative things that draw attention to him. Does that make it right? Absolutely not. You know, that's not constructive social behavior, but I could see why he would provoke that. And then I had that dream probably not long after that. So working with this kid unlocked something in me that I wasn't seeing, which was I was probably acting like a little shit, pardon my language. <laughs> I was getting a lot of negative attention, and then I was playing the victim card rather than you know figuring out a more constructive way to work with it. So that's a pivotal moment in my analysis, um, and I'm really into Nietzsche, and that kind of moment for me is what he means when he says beyond good and evil. Mm -hmm. It's not like this kind of right wing call to arms, might is right bullshit. It's this idea that psychodynamics, power dynamics and affect cause people to act certain ways. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong. That is how it is. But if you want to live a fulfilling life, you got to figure out how to play that game. So again, probably long and muddled answer, but very powerful moment for me. I, I'm curious to possibly extend the Nietzsche connection there. I recently came off of reading the genealogy of morals for like the fourth or fifth time in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's in that text we get the sort of image of active forgetting that Nietzsche talks about, right? Yeah. And yep. the dream that you're talking about seems like a kind of a moment of serial forgivenesses, right? Which kind of Nietzsche, mm -hmm, right. he kind of rages against that. And he prefers the notion of forgetfulness over forgiveness. So given that you've sort of highlighted that dream as a pivotal moment, how does that square with your affinity for Nietzsche? Right. So I gave that a lot of thought. So there's Christian forgiveness, and then there's this rallying against resentment or resentima or whatever, uh, that is a different kind of forgiveness for yourself and others, but he, Nietzsche might not call it forgiveness. Christian forgiveness, and I have nothing against Christians, but I do think it's built into their theological kind of worldview, is like, uh, it's kind of based on guilt and debt, like Nietzsche points out. Uh, so I'll give a, a practical example. Um, so, so I have a patient who they, they want to take a shower. They want to take a hot shower and dad knocks on the door, bang, bang, bang. You're wasting all the water. Stop. And this patient says, 
yells back, um, uh, I'm not wasting water. And then my intervention is, so-and-so, what if you're wasting water and that's okay? So her response is almost this Christian response of, I either have to be a good boy or, you know, it's not a boy, but you know what I mean. I either have to be a, a good boy or a bad boy. You know, it's good or evil. And there's this idea of waste, which is based around guilt and expenditure and all that stuff. And then mine is this middle space of like, what if you challenge your own moral self-criticism about waste? It's so you're worth wasting water because you want to take a warm shower and care for yourself. So um, how does that connect with my dream? I used to be in this guilt resentment loop of like these bad guys uh, were mean to this me and I'm a good guy. So they should get what's coming to them and I'm mad at them. So I was carrying around resentment. In this dream, I was able to see from their perspective how they weren't actually really ill-willed toward me. And even if they were ill-willed toward me, it came from a place of them reacting to their own power, their own impulses. So I was actually able to feel their feeling of, and this is how countertransference comes in, that kid I was working with, geez, maybe some sessions he's so annoying, I wanted to bully him too. <laughs> right. <laughs> That, well, that's what psychoanalysts do. We sit with those feelings yeah. and we notice them. And instead of acting on them, we sit with them and go, oh, this might be how this person comes off to other people. Mm. How do I share this with someone so that they don't feel hurt? They don't get bullied. Then they get the feedback from it and then they go live a more fulfilling life. Yeah. So, so in that moment, I wasn't really forgiving them. I was actually obliterating the whole idea of guilt and crime and forgiveness by just saying like, I get what you did. It didn't feel good, but I get it now. Right. So it's a very good point, though, because on the surface it looks like but – th but that's the whole thing about dream analysis is you have to look at it in like a, the bigger context of the person's like history, um, and then you have to pay attention to the feeling it produces in you or the affect and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I always work with all my patients from that Nietzsche and perspective of, you know uh, – instead of worrying about being good or bad, waste the water, you know, that's okay. Waste the water. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. It comes from a place of a purely kind of systemic empathy. Whereas as yeah. he would read Christian mode forgiveness, it's, um, you know, I, I've forgiven you, but on the presupposition that you'll get yours in the end kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> Rather than posting this subject of extinction where, you know, the yes. lightning can choose not to flash, but it does anyway, but it's okay. He'll get his end and he'll get his due in the end. Instead, it's understanding the forces that underlie these processes themselves to produce these kinds of effects. Exactly. There's still that deferred retribution fantasy. And that's what Melanie Klein talks about, uh, the depressive and manic posi or schizo positions, and that we, uh, depressive position, you, you end up, you're like, oh, I had a place, I had a part in that. The schizo position is that fantasy of retribution that the bad ones are going to get what they're going to get in the end and that the good ones are going to stay pure. So theology kind of, that's a good point though. It's a very good point. Yeah. And like Nietzsche is not necessarily opposed to you taking pleasure, right. Uh, in the, the misfortune of others, right. That's, that's normal. That's a normal sociological process for Nietzsche. Um, yeah. but particularly in, uh, the uh, towards the end of the first essay, the genealogy of morality, we get an understanding of how uh, the manifestation of bad conscience, uh, the bad conscience and uh, resentment or resentment makes that always function as something that's like eternally deferred. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, my Jungian synchronicity pilled brain right now is making the connection that the reason I read the genealogy of morals last week was to have this conversation. <laughs> so yeah. I'm having a good time. I mean, one one question, like we obviously like he opened up with DC Barker, right? As has your run in with these other figures in contemporary philosophy, right? So like the CCRU and so on. Has that informed the way in which you look? I'm not, I'm not going to ask whether it's informed your practice, but has it informed the way? you you understand the discipline of psychoanalysis uh yeah um i wrote uh some sort of extended essay in like a plutonics journal that came out i don't know if you guys seen that on twitter but they started up like a ccru type theme journal and 
uh, I think I call it hyperstitional therapeutics. Um, in psychoanalysis, they, at least in contemporary psychoanalysis, they talk about the hermeneutic circle or the hermeneutic loop. And it's just this idea that, you know, old psychoanalysis is kind of Cartesian and positivist. And what I mean by that is like, there's the practitioner, like the big daddy, and he's got all the knowledge and he sits there and analyzes the patient and he gathers data and then he makes an informed comment. And then the, uh, the patient goes, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. So it's like this very like ego kind of, there are two people in the room, two person psychology, you know, doctor patient type stuff. Now, uh, where one person is reading the other, but gradually psychoanalysis, you know, especially with things like the death of the author and like the French linguistic turn or whatever, like shifts towards hermeneutics, which is, as you guys know, two people, intersubjectivity, like two people creating a story together, a uh, shared narrative that then is used by someone to restructure the way they think about themselves. So that way they can have wider range of behavior and feeling which is healthy. Um, so hermeneutic circle is basically the same thing as hyperstition. Now, all the CCRU guys and all the accelerationist guys will say, no, it's not. They'll say uh, cyber, hyperstition is, uh, you know, occultist and cybernetic and all that stuff. But uh, they're just kind of, uh, I don't know. Whacking off? For a better term. They're, yeah, yeah, you read my mind. <laughs> they're, they're just splitting hairs, honestly. At the end of the day, it all comes down to the same kind of stuff. Yeah. It's basically two people that come together. They use functional fictions to create a shared reference system, and then they create a story together, and then that story becomes real. Mm -hmm. And often these stories are full of strange coincidences and resonances and all that stuff. So right. I wrote about how a patient brought in a story, and it was a story I had learned Something, it was basically something eerily similar to what I had talked about in a, a theory class like two weeks earlier that the professor had brought up. And then I used his idea to make sense of the patient's chaotic experience. And it created this story together that really helped this kid out. Mm. So the concept of hyperstition in particular um, informs my practice with people directly. Yes. All the other stuff. I mean, accelerationism and the CCRU stuff is basically just pulled from Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle um, and, and Deleuze and Guattari, who do an amazing job using and, and also critiquing Freud. That's right. So that's where I got into that stuff, kind of just like uh, through the pipeline. You know, who is this Nick Land fellow? Why do people keep talking about him? And then I read, oh, my God, this guy's nuts. And <laughs> I think I... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even this notion of um, the uh, hyperstition is uh, borrows a lot from uh, the idea of sigilization from Burroughs, and you can yeah. in the form of you know uh, Grant Morrison with the hyper sigil. Yeah, yeah. And it's also very closely connected with that notion of fabulation. Mm -hmm. um, I think I put out some tweets that said hyperstition is just fabulation for people who like the Amen Break and the Japanese version of Super Metroid. <laughs> you might have remembered that. <laughs> That's a good yeah, one. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up because, yeah, I think there is this idea, you know, there's a sexiness to these terms, um, hyperstition, yeah. and there's a, a kind of a heroic impulse that goes into, oh, what would it be like to create a new future? But there's something about the process that we're talking about here today that I even think is happening in the context of this podcast, which is there's a, an almost unassuming and mundane quality in, in the sort of initiation of this rite that brings to mm -hmm. bear in, you know, a, a kind of beautiful unfolding that's very much unlike the kind of heroic impulse from which it was initially imagined. Yes. And I often write in my blog that the truth is boring. It's, it's incredibly boring. <laughs> like I have a blog. Did you guys see the, uh, stop me if I'm talking too much. That's the other cliche is, uh, Psychotherapist, we listen to people all day, and then you get us talking, and we won't shut the hell up. So stop me if I'm going. You're the guest. Keep yeah, you're here. You're here explicitly <laughs> to do that. <laughs> have, for it. have you guys seen uh, the Netflix special where they talk about the girl who disappeared in the uh, hotel? The, yeah, the Cecil Hotel. I know, I know about yeah. it. Yeah, I know. I haven't, I haven't seen it. So there was all these paranoid conspiracy theories about like. Uh, all these occultist things that could have happened to her. Was it ghosts? Was it government? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and we can link to the blog later maybe, but it was like, it's like, no, it's just a really bad part of town 
probably the worst part of town in the entire U.S. And it attracts, there's a number of circumstances that come together to make it this really high crime, low uh, police presence area. And criminal activity really ex- blows up there of all kinds. And there's low supervision. So this person went there. It's just, in other words, a number of regularly explained circumstances came together that ex- had a really boring explanation, which was someone went off their medication and mm. and was ill and then hurt themselves and ended up drowning. Yeah. But it's the same idea. And I linked, I link it to this other show, uh, one of those haunting shows on Netflix. Hill House? Or- Hill House. Yeah. Hill House. So the whole thing there is like, uh, ghosts aren't really these, and, and same with The Shining, you know, and like kind of Mark Fisher's reading of that kind of stuff of like the supernatural is in the natural realm. It's actually explainable by natural phenomenon. And this is Jung's, Jung's thing too, is that the mystical is actually embodied in the material. So all these beautiful, big, sc- scary, epic feeling things, they're really just a, a cover up for the fact that the truth is actually very mundane and boring. Mm. But when you start to learn that the truth is mundane and boring, you actually can have fun in life. That's right. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the flip side. I think that's Nietzsche too, um, to, to an extent he goes manic. And, and, and well too, that's like part of what drives Nietzsche to say things like acquire as many perspectives as possible. Right. So like, exactly. you know, we, we love, we love Fisher uh, on this podcast, but one place where I would push back is like, I think, like for example, Mark Fisher just gets Nietzschean perspectivism wrong. <laughs> you know, like a Nietzschean perspectivism is not this this uh, assertion that you know the the Jordan Petersonian. Oh, well, these postmodernists come in with their billion different perspectives on what a mundane event is. But the reality yeah. is, is that like there are so many ways into the same event, the the same relation that uh, in order to actually be to be able to have sort of a, a I don't want to say grounded, but a sort of uh, sufficient understanding, one needs to see ex- like exactly what the scope of those forces is. And like, to me, right. that's what often what uh, people get wrong about the, the perspectivism of Nietzsche. Totally agree. Per- perspectivism is not relativism. No, not at all. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not not this weird postmodern thing. And I had a really good philosophy undergrad teacher. He was this kick-ass progressive rabbi, and he wrote a two-volume set on Nietzsche. So he pretty much taught me Nietzsche and Kant, and we spent hours talking about perspectivism and how it's not relativism. Mm -hmm. Because in your undergrad era, it's like relativism is either the coolest thing or the most offensive thing (laughs) if you're like really concrete in those years like I was. And I was like really – not a fan of relativism. I was like, no, there has to be a shared reality and all that stuff. (laughs) I like Nietzsche. How does Nietzsche, you know, vibe with that? But then, so I totally agree with you, Will, that uh, I do think Fisher misunderstands that. But that's because, you know, Fisher was really aiming for some sort of political project, I would argue. And Nietzsche's perspectivism can lend itself to politics, but can also diffuse into some pretty anti-political uh, stuff. So I think that's a fascinating the the the, the anti political in Nietzsche. What do you, what do you mean by that? I, I like that. I think perspective. Uh, if you have a number of perspectives, I think it's hard to come together in any communal sense unless you really are kind of jiving with Deleuze and Guattari and stuff of univocality. Mm-hmm. And this is where exactly. I get in a little over my head because I'm really actually not a philosophy guy. I just kind of dabble in it, but. Um, it, if if you're gonna, if you're going to have many voices in the crowd, uh, you don't want it to get squashed under one representative or a handful of representatives. That's just democracy, and we see how that works out all the time. And you don't want it to just be a choir of chaos because then nothing gets done. Um, and that's like I think the big problem of politics is how do we get people to coexist together, live together, and then have their voices together. Or exit, you know, the voice exit thing. But yeah, and, and then in some ways, like too, uh, we often see Nietzsche come back in so many different ways to to critique democracy. But one of uh, the more the more fascinating criticisms that I've seen uh, 
of democracy that utilizes Nietzsche is is Mario Tronti's essay on on democracy and democracy as a function of biopolitics. And to Tronti, Nietzsche's last man is sort of the figure of democracy in in such a way that democracy can only function if it's predisposed by like a particular kind of massification of thought, that it becomes the sort of um, apparatus that makes the, you know, the figure of the smallest human being in Zarathustra, for example, who, who, you know, um, if one isn't uh, hobbling, one is in a hurry, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, makes those sorts of figures of, of aberrance sort of a problem. And it, like, it makes the, the, the smallest uh, human being possible. So, yeah, I think, I, I think the way you approach Nietzsche is fascinating, too, because like, there are always all of these discussions about the relationship between Freud and Nietzsche, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you talk to, to a Nietzschean in, in any given uh, philosophy department, there will always be sort of a very, either it'll, it'll go in one direction or the other as it pertains to, to their understanding of the relationship between say Freud and Nietzsche or also Jung uh, and Nietzsche too. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering like, how do you, how do you square that relationship between uh, Freud and, and Nietzsche? Yeah. You should send me that essay. It sounds interesting and I haven't heard of it. I will. Um, well, I love Freud. I love Nietzsche. Freud, and you guys stop me if you know all this stuff already, but I find it so interesting. Freud referred to Nietzsche as the first psychoanalyst, and that's in his biography somewhere. Um, and Freud owned a, uh, the collection of Nietzsche's books, but he would never talk about them. And the quote is something like, if I talk about this guy, everyone will think I just didn't come up with anything new and stole all his ideas. So Nietzsche's throughout Nietzsche's reference kind of implicitly throughout a lot of Freud's works beyond the pleasure principle, interpretation of dreams, ego and group psychology, um, but but not directly. Um, so Otto Rank, one of the early Freudians who was a big Nietzsche and actually bought Freud for his birthday a collection of Nietzsche's books. And the inside joke was, I know you already have these, but because you tell everyone you don't, I bought you the collection. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go through the old notes of the early psychoanalytic meetings, um, they you read, uh, I always mispronounce it, Essay Homo. Is that how you say it? Okay, Homo. Homo. You're fine. Okay. I'm not a good pronunciation guy. <laughs> yeah, um, it's all good. So they read that and they went through it and kind of analyzed it. So all the early psychoanalysts were obviously really influenced by Nietzsche. And that's because, you know, when you read through Nietzsche, everything he's saying is just what Freud says later. Freud just puts it into practice. And that's that the body is really in the driver's seat. And, you know, here's Andre Green does a really good job in his books of doing this. But here's the Freudian metapsychology in 30 seconds. Uh, here's the body. It's full of life force in a non-mystical ways way. It wants to grow. It does what it's going to do regardless of what we want it to do. It's out of our control. Um, you know, as it grows, it creates this feedback loop that we think of as the mind. Um, and the body, what it does, gets translated into things in the mind. So drives and drives produce affects and affects produce thoughts. And then from there, in that stew, we have feelings. Oh, God, this 30-second thing went over 30 seconds and it's all muddled. But anyways, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Freud and Nietzsche are saying the same thing. Mm. The body and its drives produce feelings and thoughts rather than a, like the Cartesian mode of like, you know, the mind-body dualism and all that stuff. Um, so Nietzsche and Freud, to me, fit nicely. Mm. Same with Jung. Jung... Uh, Jung's interest in myth and the way he kind of uses it to think and to, to express himself is, you know, straight from Nietzsche. And I think Jung leans into his Nietzscheanism, whereas yeah. Freud kind of sways away from it. Freud wants to be a scientist. Jung is okay with being whatever people want him to be. And that is much more Nietzschean. <laughs> um, so I love them both. I love all three of them. They're all great. Well, this is a, a nice juncture in the conversation to make this connection from Freud through Jung back to D&G, Deleuze and Gattari. It's interesting, like if we were to track a 
maybe a non-teleological evolution of the psychoanalytic practice through those figures, we see a dissolution of the notion of the ego, right? Going from Freud mm -hmm. to Jung, who deprioritized the ego and even called the, the notion of it into question in his later work, preferring... I think in some ways actualized Nietzsche's project much more closely in theorizing psyche and anima and that sort of thing. But then when we get to Deleuze and Gattari, I think we get something, and this is what we kind of talked about on Twitter, at least alluded to on Twitter, was that the work of, of Jung on the, on the concept of psyche and anima and the notion of depersonalization and the idea that um, our drives, that that we as human beings, what it means to be human is to be constructed of a multiplicity of archetypal energies or flows, if you will. And then in Anti-Oedipus, I mean, there's, there's that section, I believe it's in chapter three, maybe at the beginning of chapter three, where they're talking about the, the crisscrossing of intensities, like over the geodesic dome, where the substrate of our very being as human beings isn't lined with archetypes. It's lined with these intensities that are even more primary. And so um, that brings me then to the notion of schizoanalysis. Now, without going into like a 40-minute lecture on what schizoanalysis is, I'll say that I see schizoanalysis as a process of, of realizing ourselves as a vast array of tiny machines in this broader scheme of social production that involves destructive and creative gestures. And I'm curious, in, in relation to your psychoanalytic practice, I mean, part of what schizoanalysis is about is not only seeing the body, the mind, the drives as this hermetically sealed interiority, but there's a connection to the outside world, namely the world of capitalism. How does your awareness of schizoanalysis factor in to the way that you practice psychoanalysis on the ground? Two, two kind of vignettes come to mind. So one of my training cases years ago, and I'll kind of not share too many details, just out of sake of ethics and confidentiality, this old guy who needed a kidney dialysis. So he was attached to these machines that functioned as his organs. Um, so in place of his internal kidney was basically this external kidney. And the way he treated me was almost as if I myself was a kidney. So I remember feeling in session with him, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So there are patients that are more able to relate to you and they can kind of understand that you have your own mind. You might have your own thoughts or feelings. This fellow really could not conceptualize, probably for a number of reasons, that I might have my own perspective or my own thoughts or feelings. He would really, and this is kind of Kleinian language, Melanie Klein, he would really dump his bad bits in me. So I was just there to collect his, anything he couldn't tolerate in his body or mind. So like, his frustrations, maybe his sexual urges that he felt because um, he was a Christian were not something that were a part of him. Uh, so that's classic in schizophrenia. You want to project the things that you can't tolerate onto someone else. Um, so I would feel leave the session feeling exhausted, like, am I a terrible person? Um, and then in supervision, they would help me say, well, no, he's, he's dumping on you the the stuff that he can't handle. That's your, that's actually your function right now in the relationship. You were a dialysis so, machine of sorts. <laughs> exactly. I was a dialysis machine. And again, I like to stress this stuff isn't mystical. Like his way of relating to his body was through a machine. And that machine was a little, uh, basically a little instantiation of the giant machinations of capitalism. So I did a ton of research for that on how capital capitalized the medical industry had become, or rather how much the medical industry is itself just a giant arm of capitalism, um, how pretty much everything becomes squeezing the bottom dollar out. Insurance companies basically work on the death drive and that you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt all these things before you can get anything from them. So I always tell people when I work at my hospital job and the parents are like, why does my kid have to leave next week, even though they're not really better? I say the insurance company's job really at the end of the day is to give you as little fucking time as possible and to kick you out of the door. Yeah. So that kind of like lines up with some Foucauldian stuff. I know you're a big Foucault guy, Will. Um, but uh, so this guy basically in the room, 
I was just, I wasn't a person. I was a partial object that he just attached to, to basically dump his bad shit into and eject after 50 minutes, just like the kidney dialysis machine. So his milieu, his, his grid of understanding was just completely coded in capitalist language as well. He would talk pretty much just about his team. He Basically, all the language he would use wasn't language you would use to talk to people. It was all this kind of corporatized uh, language, like uh, return on investment, business ontology, business ontology type language. And so I had this idea that like, here's a perfect schizoanalytic. So not really a case. I wasn't doing schizoanalysis with him, but here's a perfect example of schizoanalysis in the working. This schizo guy who's tied up to literal machines, who treats me like a partial object, who's embedded in this capitalist kind of network, who can't think outside. So that's Guattari's big thing is the the network you're enmeshed in machinically totally codes and conditions the way you think about yourself. And you have to learn how to think outside of that to actually be yourself. So that's one thing that comes to mind. The other thing that comes to mind is, you know, how Guattari actually worked with patients and what schizoanalysis underneath all the philosophical language really is. And he was very provocative. So there's the bit in Intersecting Lives where a friend comes up to him and she's like, I'm, I think I want to kill myself. I think life's not worth living. And he coyly smiles and goes, well, why don't you do it already? And such, a, such an irresponsible response to a friend invoked in her a deep laughter. Because she was expecting the morose, no, you shouldn't do it. Everyone loves you. I love you. I'd be so sad. But he brought her the unexpected and he was confident in the way he delivered it. And in the context, the message she received was, uh, I know you have a lot to live for. So he tapped in basically on the life drive. And she felt that as a friend. So this is so Nietzschean and that the kind of friendship vibe kind of overrid some of the depression, the provocation and the unexpectedness. You know, the body without organs and transversality is really about doing the unexpected. Um, you know, all this talk of molecular, it's it's about you think it's going to be one way. You think everything is necessary, but actually everything's contingent. So if you think I'm going to respond that way, I'm going to do this. Of course, he got that from Lacan, who they call the first psych, uh, schizoanalyst. Lacan would do things like that all the time, though Lacan did a lot of damage. If you guys read my blog, I'm not very much of a Lacan fan. He was very unethical and I think did a lot of damage to his patients. But schizoanalysis is those moments. Another moment, and then I'll stop and let you guys talk, is he brings up the same motif, Guattari, in several of his books, and it's about a car. Vehicles, cars were so important. So he learned to drive late in life. So there's something in there, but either a friend brings a dream to him or he's analyzing his own dream in schizoanalytic cartographies. And he talks about how the car isn't just a car. It's basically your, your kind of, um, your, your halfway between yourself as an individual and the outside world. So it's like a point of transversality again. Um, so that's schizoanalytic where if someone comes to me and they're like, and I think this is the example he uses. Someone's like, you know, I want to learn how to drive and I'm really anxious about it. You know, the psychoanalytic route would be to like spend weeks or months like analyzing where that anxiety comes from, suggesting interpretations, blah, blah, blah. The schizoanalytic approach is, and Guattari would do stuff like this, is you better get in a car tomorrow or I'm kicking you out of treatment. <laughs> uh, so he was very provocative. He was very provocative and he was almost a behaviorist. Mm. So behaviorism gets a terrible rap because it's really gone and done a lot of, it basically just been geared towards uh, compliance uh, again. And it's very Foucauldian in that it just wants people to be different. Um, and that's the opposite of psychoanalysis and the opposite of schizoanalysis. But Watari was big on eth ethology or ethology, the study of animals, study of behavior. Mm -hmm. Yep. So a lot of his- So is Deleuze. So is Deleuze, yes. So a lot of his interventions are about doing rather than about reflecting. And I think that's key to schizoanalysis. Um, so there's a few there's a few thoughts. So I do some of that stuff uh, with the hospital patients. They're so morose and they got every right to be. I mean, they got tough lives, but I I try to provoke in some sometimes when I get a good rapport with them, 
I try to do provocative things because uh, I think it injects a little life. Um, so that's that's how I do the it. golden laughter. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm wondering how this relates to the idea of the temporality of the analytic session, and particularly as it distanced itself from Lacan with his most notorious innovation, which was the variable length session. <laughs> yeah, it seems like with um. <laughs> I mean, when I went to a uh, Lacanian psychoanalyst, it seems that the longer I went to them, the shorter the session ended up being. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, go are, figure. We're, we're talking about the, the provocative nature of schizoanalysis. It's kind of like a, a staccato rhythm of, uh, kind of a sh- almost like a, a shock therapy in terms of connecting with the most base uh, connection of the life drive, for example. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit in terms of the, the temporality of a schizoanalytic session or the course of a schizoanalytic process. Yeah. So I think, you know, D and G are both really right and really wrong when they say Lacan was the first schizoanalyst. They say that in anti-Oedipus like once or twice. He was both incredibly Oedipal and embodied all the things they might disagree with in psychoanalysis. And then he also had, yes, the very length session, which, you know, a supervisor once came to my institute and said, yeah. I knew the person who I knew one of his analysis and he would he would squeeze in like uh, a ton of patients in an hour and he would charge them all 200, 300 bucks. This guy was a millionaire for his time, basically. Um, so it became a capitalist kind of thing. But at the heart is the theory of desire, um, which D&G obviously recuperate from Lacan. And it's the idea that um, standard time. That doesn't desire doesn't work on standard time. You know, it doesn't really know time. In the anti Oedipus papers, like Watari's notes before writing it, I think he talks about aeonic time and then this other kind of time. I forget what the uh, Chronos. Yeah, yeah. So one is ordered, and then one is just like this free floating kind of aesthetic experience. Mm-hmm. And schizoanalysis is interested in that other one. Um, now, what does that look like for actual practice? I mean. My my supervisors and stuff say, oh, you got to stick to the 50-minute window, blah, blah, blah. I don't do that, even at work. Um, and this is, again, why I'm anonymous, because if people at work heard this, I'd get in trouble, because <laughs> the, the state mandates that you see these folks for a certain amount of time. But some people I want to see longer, because I feel like it's helpful to them. Some people I, I see much shorter, because I feel that that's actually much more helpful to them. You know? We get to the 20 minute mark and there's a lull. Some people I'll sit that lull out and see what happens. Some people I'll say, this feels like a good place to stop. Let's come back tomorrow and talk. So that's actually much more closer to real life. So psychoanalysis is always confused between whether it's like uh, part of reality itself or set aside from reality, observing reality. It seems as though, to to a certain extent, like the life of the patient and the methodology you come into the room with seem to be conflated in such a way that it, it can sometimes hinder what you may want to achieve with that patient. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It, and that's kind of like the epistemological critique at the heart of anti Oedipus that I love is, uh, it what do what do they say? Uh, basically, they just say. You know, we're not saying all this stuff doesn't exist, all this psychoanalytic stuff. We're just asking whose fantasy is it? <laughs> it's, there's some beautiful line in there like that. And they say Oedipal, the Oedipal thing is something a father or a male will see when they see a patient. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a father's fantasy. That's a father's projected jealousy of their son, perhaps. So that's the them putting Nietzsche back, Nietzsche and Freud back on Freud is – yeah. You put Freud on the couch and you go, so why are you so interested in all this stuff, man? And then he has to be analyzed. And that's what schizoanalysis is as well. They say, we're not getting rid of psychoanalysis. It's like Watchmen, though. It's like, who will watch the Watchmen, you know, or whatever from that graphic novel. Schizoanalysis is supposed to analyze psychoanalysis, um, which I think it, it does to an extent. Yeah, we're not saying Oedipus isn't real, right? Yeah, exactly. That kind of stuff. You know. Here's a perhaps an interesting non sequitur that will also be our segue. I um 
well, must have been three or four years ago now, through um, the school that I, I currently work for, I received a three-day ticket to Tony Robbins. Um, what I forget what it was called. It was a three-day event. I, I stayed in San Jose. You know, there was techno music, pump-up sessions, and the whole thing. And inside, nice. oh, yeah, inside the front cover of of the reading materials for that three day session was this quote from Freud. Really? And it's precisely about what we're talking about here, how he uses these techniques of provocation in order to, you know, take somebody out of state. <clears throat> That's one of the ways that he would put it. But I mean, clearly Tony Robbins is firmly embedded in the capitalist ontology. Yeah. Right. But it, it, it's interesting to see how that, you know, often Deleuze and Gattari get criticized, you know, by somebody like Zizek, for example, oh, this manual here, we could use it to be a kind of capitalist of sorts. And I think the same could be said for for somebody in advertising or some sort of malign therapist out there just destroying the world. I don't know. Provocation is a, is a tool that should only be used uh, very precisely by seasoned people with people who can handle it. If, if I'm working with someone who's actually going to, I think they're actually going to hurt themselves, I'm not going to provoke them because that's not my goal. I don't know if you remember that Tony Robbins was embroiled in this scandal like where he did something to a woman at a live event, right? Mm -hmm. And it kind of triggered her. She was like a sexual abuse survivor or something like that. Mm -hmm. That was the event that I was at. And I saw that with my with my naked eyes. And I'm like, wow, that, that's going to be in the news. Yeah. Oh, my. And that's, and that's why you don't do that to everyone. Yeah. You have to know the person you're working with. And you have to know it's going to land. And then you have to not be yeah. afraid and be confident to employ, employ that. Um, Oh my gosh. He's the big uh, self-help kind of guru guy, right. right? And he does those big seminars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know he's still doing those. Oh uh, yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I, I have, you know, this sort of amateur, like sort of research program outside of all this, where I just follow these people, Joel Olstein, all, oh. all those people, you know what I mean? And, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I always thought he was an interesting one because I'm I'm a 90s kid and that's when he kind of came up. And it was interesting to see that became like a whole kind of trope in the 90s where you have this mm -hmm. sort of infomercial yeah. therapist, mm -hmm. you know, kind of. Yeah. yeah, that sort of became the model for sort of uh, the way we understand like self-betterment as a uh, thing that can be sort of purchased. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, it was sort of done through like the TV subscription model, right? You have these figures that attract like eyeballs and so on. And like, I, I guess that's the function too of watching something like uh, a Dr. Phil, right? Uh, is that to, to sort of watch the process go on, you can sort of offload any sort of uh, need that you might have to sort of have that interaction offload it to the two figures that are on the box, you know, giving you the images back and they can go through the traumatic process for you um, while you sit back. Well, if we want to be exact about it, Will, in the 90s, Tony Robbins put out the 15 CD set of Personal Power. And it was 30 minute, 30 minute <laughs> nice. sessions. I actually did the whole thing like a long time ago. I was like, I'm just going to do this, see what happens. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because it does have an effect on your life, right? I mean, just really embodying any set of beliefs. Like if you've done something like CBT, you know, it at least is going to have some kind of temporary effect so long as those beliefs are circulating. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's, it's like those few hype records. That's the hyperstitional aspect of it is any belief system will have an effect, even if it's not really attached to like a widespread kind of shared reality. Um, yeah. And that's why too, like with, with hyperstition, like one of the things Matt and I often discuss, like off the air, if we can call it that, uh, is what's the relationship between this notion of hyperstition we see all over the place and just like standard reification as it's understood in like Lukacs, uh, through Marcuse even. Yeah, I think they're pretty interchangeable to an extent. I know the, the, the hyperstition heads, if you will, would say that it has to be something that's very clearly fictional, that is in a fictional realm, and then it creates real effects. So like reification is like, well, you guys know what reification is, but like the Necronomicon is the big, you know, hyperstitional artifact where like, it's clearly a fictional thing, but then people are calling into the library trying to take one out 
So it created an aspect of reality for itself that took on a life beyond itself. Whereas reification is like, you know, if I talk about the ego and then we're all talking about the ego, but then we all just assume we all know what that means. And it's like, well, there really isn't such a thing as the ego. It's just a fiction that we used to divide up the world. Uh, so I guess it's literary, but they're, pr they're pretty close. Does the fiction have to be maintained? Like, d d does, does the fiction have to develop alongside this new, like, manifest reality? Like, because that's... Well, I guess it's just a different series. I guess with the high position, the autonomy is posited as real autonomy, the real autonomy of the fiction yeah. itself. For example, the okay. economical, its power is in the citation to generate its own mythos through the mere exactly. fact of citing it. Whereas in the reification, it's presupposed that it's, it's a false reality that is treated as if it is has its own autonomy, but really its autonomy is uh, parasitic on the autonomy of uh, the capital production, which is the parasitism on uh, surplus labor. Did you ever think you were going to be in a conversation that combined Tony Robbins and hyperstition? <laughs> I could have never told you that, but it's so cool. You know, you guys know Jules Taylor yeah. on Twitter? Yes. Yeah. He, I talked with him too, and he went to some of these kinds of self-help inspirational things. So we talked a little bit about that on his too. I forget the names of his. What was the other one that was popular? It was like ED something or EMS, was it? Is this Tony Robbins? It's like Tony Robbins adjacent, but it's not Tony oh, Robbins. Oh, you're thinking of NLP. I think so, Neuro Linguistic yes. Programming. He calls his NAC, and I forget what uh, the acronym stands for, but it's essentially is that thing. Yeah. Is that just Becoming a Sigma by listening to a 10-hour YouTube video? <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> it's it's ironic because Tony Robbins has a lot of the physical characteristics of that, you know, that ripped dude you see in black and white and all the memes, <laughs> that guy yeah. from Rush. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, oh, the, the mega Chad. Or mega whatever. Chad. Yeah. He, yeah, has yeah, a, yeah. he has a lot of mega Chad characteristics. <laughs> the giga. Oh, the giga, giga Chad. Sorry. Giga Chad. My bad. Giga Chad. Don't get <laughs> Thank you, Will. Don't want to get called out. Important. That. Yeah, I'm way too online. That's so embarrassing that I even know. Uh, Self-help confidence, you know, NAC. Yeah. No, it's actually cocaine. Oh, <laughs> same thing, I guess. Um, well, we're, we're coming up on the hour. I don't want to keep you too long. I, it's probably midnight where you are, right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a night owl. Oh, you are? Because yeah. we, we did we did come on here initially to talk about some dream that I had. Um, yeah. do, do you interpret dreams like in your practice? I do. Oh, you do? Um, do? Do you want me to tell you how I work with dreams? Well, how about we do this? I have this dream that I brought into Jungian analysis more than 20 years ago. And this is a big dream, big, big dream. I mean, there's big dreams, right? But this is like the big one. And I would say, um, and I, I'm just putting it out there because this can be also used. So now that we're at the hour mark, this part of the podcast can be used as, as an ASMR session, just listening to my dreams. Okay. <laughs> um, but I, I think the dream is really interesting. I, I kind of have a Jungian understanding of it. And I'm, I'm not asking you to interpret the dream per se, but maybe in the context of what I deliver here, you could just talk about how you would go about looking at that or what kind of questions. Yeah, you yeah. Ask. That sounds okay? great. All right. So here's a dream. First of all, here's a context. So I'm living overseas. I've been in Japan for about two years at this point, you know, going through little waves of culture shock, some alienation, but a lot of good times too. And suddenly I have like a month or a couple months where it's just, it's just bad dreams every night, big ones, very clear, right? And then everything comes to a head with this one dream. And so here's how it goes. The dream begins in the attic of a mysterious home in a small neighborhood I lived in as a child. The attic is filled with furniture shrouded in dust covers. My best friend at the time of having this dream appears from beneath one of the large sheets and he is smiling and gesturing towards a small ventilation fan that is lodged in the wall. The blades of the fan pass slowly, allowing me to peer into the side yard of the property. There, a frail, naked woman with very fair skin is trying to push an old-fashioned lawnmower through the overgrowth. As the fan blade passes by, I'm able to jump through a gap in the wall and tumble into the yard. I rush to the woman's aid, taking her place, whereupon I begin pushing the lawnmower. 
I look to her for some recognition in my act of modest heroism, but it seems she has disappeared. Things change. I gaze down the length of the property at another home I could only describe as the home of the rich folks. The overgrown lawn merges with a tall, natural growing grass that is billowing in the wind. The sky grows dark, but it is not night. Floating above the tall grass is another woman. She hovers, her eyes glazed over with a milky white film. Where her nipples would be, there is instead a pair of eyes that gaze at me intently. She has Japanese facial features, and her skin, as paradoxical as it may sound, is the color of a luminous shadow. In any case, she appears to me as foreign, for lack of a better term. She's partially clad in a loose drape of cloth, and her hair is alive, almost like Medusa. She has a very powerful energy, which is difficult to resist, though it is not an explicit sexual attraction which I'm lured in by. It's as if her figure pulls at every fiber of my being. She gestures towards a warped picnic table in a nearby clearing. Dinner is about to be served. I sit down and await my meal. She places something in front of me, but I'm afraid to look down. Working up some courage, I glance at the table to see an empty plate. To be honest, I'm a bit beside myself, and I seek some consolation from her. I look up to her, and sheepishly I ask, Can we make love? Upon my request, the woman morphs into a grotesque demon and lets loose a horrible, deafening cry that leaves me cowering on the bench. As my wits return to me, she returns to her original form and then gestures once again in another direction, this time towards the horizon. There is a raging fire on a hill that seems at once distant and nearby. On the burning hill, there is a gallows. A silhouette of a boy swings in front of the conflagration, which is about to engulf the whole scene. And that was the dream. Are you okay, Adam? Fuck, you know. Oh, boy. I wish the listeners could see Adam's face. (laughs) Listeners, it is currently 5 a.m. where I am right now. Wow. I'm entering the the, the dreamscape. The Onerion is flowing through my eyes right now, and that was some shit. (laughs) uh, I'm definitely uh, very intrigued. Let me... Do you want me to jump into it? Sure, go ahead. Well, so this is not necessarily what I would do first, but I do want to gather... What did you guys think? What were your What were your feelings while you sat and listened? Do, do you want to go first, Adam? Because you you had such a palpable just, response. Just in a few words, association or feeling. Hmm. Well, my my main thing was I am very very tired. But, um, my but the uh, on top of that, I mean, the idea of the horizon, the gallows. It's very it's a bit hard to get in for me in terms of the horizon of being, which is bounded only by death. I mean, the, the, the notion of the the solicitation of the, the other figure of the woman with this very monstrous, yet not necessarily hostile response, but simply a display of of power and morphology. And it's it's quite hard to interpret from my position right now. But um, What did it arouse in your mm, body? That's what I'm curious about. I thought, oh, dreams be nice. I could dream in I could dream in about twenty minutes from now. It made you want to made you think about your sleepiness. Absolutely. <laughs> How about you, Will? I so for me, like there was this sort of like the the way I pictured this whole interaction was just like I felt for some reason I felt I was in the seat of the sort of uh, for lack of a better word protagonist of this dream, and I felt like 
fundamentally infantilized by the whole thing. Like I felt like a child out in like a rented house with no electricity. Yeah. I just felt like a, I don't know, like a little kid was, I don't know. No, I think that's spot on. I think, um, it has a, so the point of a dream is to keep you asleep. So the conflict doesn't wake you up. And it's certainly coded with a lot of kind of childhood memory, kind of melancholia, kind of ontological uh, type theme up themes. Here's how I work with dreams. Here's how contemporary psychoanalysts work with dreams. Here's the first things I notice. I notice that, and it's not fun. This is my, my, my motto. Uh, the truth is always boring. Um, so you present the dream as one that's already been presented to an analyst from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I know there's been some numbers of unconscious revisions to the dream. Mm. You've written it down. So I know it's become reified. And that's not a bad thing. That's what the mind does. But I know it now has added layers that weren't there when they first were there. Mm. So you've added to the dream work, okay. so to speak, without, without knowing it. Um, so I think, let's see. Here's how, if someone brings a dream to me in a session, my first thought is, what made them think of that dream now? So if someone brings a dream to you in the beginning of a session, it means they've been sitting on it. They want to share it with you. And it usually is an invitation. It means they want you to try and figure it out with them. It, they usually come in. They're excited. I, I had a dream. So part of them unconsciously knows that psychoanalysts work on dreams. So they're actually trying to please me. They're trying to give me a gift. Mm. Say, would you like my idea? Hmm. Or would you like me to just listen? That's what I ask. If someone asks me to share my idea, I think about what ideas I want to share based on what therapeutic intervention I want to make. Or I don't share. If I really don't want to share, I say, I'm not going to share right now. So boring. I know, boring. But uh, so my next thought, say they don't come prepared with a dream and they're talking about something else. And then all of a sudden they go, it goes silent. This happens. And they go, so I had a dream. So I ask, they can tell the dream. I go, so what happened in the silence right before you told me the dream? Well, I don't know. Well, I know you don't know, but try to recall it. Mm. Because there was a sentence, then there was a pause, then there was a dream. Something happened in the pause. And even if something didn't happen in that moment, going back and thinking about it, you can make a link between your sentence and the dream. So that provides context. So if someone's telling me uh, that they hate this they hate their landlord, their landlord's a piece of shit, and, uh, and they trail off and it's silent. And then they talk about a dream about their their family. I go, huh, I wonder if if the affect carried over and that's what triggered the dream. Maybe, so I suggest maybe you're maybe, you know, your your father's like the landlord. It's very Oedipal, but it doesn't have to necessarily follow the whole Oedipal scheme. I'm sticking with the feeling or the affect. Um but this dream, so I guess when you analyze dreams, you look at it as a form thing and a content thing. Your dream has amazing content, but the form is taken out of the natural context. So it, it makes me curious about that. It's a, it's a dream to present, actually. It's a dream that's rich in content and beautiful, so it's made to present. Mm. It's a gift for everyone, mm. actually. Mm. You're a very giving person. <laughs> but as far as the content, um, well, a few associations I had along the way. I'm thinking, this is so rich. How am I going to retain it all? And then I go, well, this is my internal monologue. Freud's theory is really spot on that every figure in the dream is part of yourself. And Jung, to some extent, agrees with that as well. And that's not a mystical thing again. It's that we can only produce from our own well of experiences, from our own body, from our own mind. I can't ever be in your body and then have your experience. So these are figures from your past. I see a little boy, you know, the attic immediately makes me think of either Freud's structural system of ego, super ego, id. Um, so the ego would be uh, the middle where you live, the id would be the basement, and the super ego is the attic. But I also think, and I've wrote about this on my blog, the two places that are haunted in houses are either the attic or the basement, where everyone lives in a family usually isn't haunted the the dark forces dwell up higher up low um 
So I think there's a haunted factor to it. Mm. These things are put away. They're dusty. They're not seen anymore. Uh, the house is not populated by others except this long lost friend. So there's really no joy in the dream. Um, there's very, there's no pleasure. Even the sexual aspect is immediately defended against and guarded and nasty and has reaction formation to it. Mm. I feel like, yeah. um, so it's an unpleasant dream. It's almost a nightmare. It's a dream about faded memories, about loss. It's a dream about perhaps lack of nutrition or stress around eating, maybe food insecurity. It's a dream about difference, and that could be sexual or could be monetary. Um, and it's a dream about growth with the lawn coming and going. Yeah. Um, I had the association to the lawn mowing lady as an anorexic woman who isn't taking care of herself and she's not taking care of you. And then here's a beautiful association as well. I forget who says it. I think it's Melanie Klein. So the infant is faced with the breast and the breast envelops the infant's whole view. And Melanie Klein kind of jokingly says the infant, if if it could have a thought in that moment, would have the thought, what does this thing want from me? And the idea is there's an instinct and there's a motor kind of memory that it knows to suckle, but the breast is what Lacanians or what uh, Laplanche, ex-Lacanian would call an enigmatic signifier. So it's this thing that I know I want it, but I don't really know what it does. So quite literally, you transfix your breasts into eyes. So that's kind of like this paranoid position of the baby gazes at the breast hmm. and it actually feels like the guest, the breast is gazing back at it. So it's a, it's a dream about feeding and, and that being scary. Another thing kids have to do is when their parents are stressed or when their parents are uh, fighting or when there's stress in the house, the kid and you're a teacher, so I'm sure you've yeah. seen this. The kid often takes on a lot of that and carries it with oh, yeah. him. And I know because I did that as a kid. Mom and dad are stressed. I better be an extra good boy. Mm. Let me do some extra work for you guys. Now, the context of it being abroad makes me think that being in a new place where you might not have known people, where the customs are different and you have to constantly be learning and almost tense and stressed out, could have triggered a lot of these things. Maybe you felt like you were a child again and you had to grow up again yeah. and be a different person. I know their customs around food are very different. So I wonder if that's in it too. Interesting. Um, yeah. So all these things came to mind. Um, if you were in session with me and I, and you asked for my thoughts, I would share those thoughts with you. And then I would say, does any of that make sense with you? And if you said, no, you're way off, I'd be like, wow, I really got you wrong. And it'd be like a nice moment where I can be criticized and you can get some uh, nice feeling about it. But what do you think of some of that stuff? Does any of it hit the mark? Or is it all nuts? Absolutely. And I would say they're parallel or at least the interpretation that I was working with at the time is very hospitable to the one that you've just offered me. And I would say shortly after that event, there was kind of a growth surge in me. It was kind of a wake-up call of sorts. Mm -hmm. The one takeaway from this conversation is, is going to be a twist on Nietzsche's uh, famous quote. If you gaze into the breast, the breast <laughs> gazes back at you. So there is yes. something, ha and, and I, I'm, I'm being cute here, but like there is something to that, I think, in the context of this dream. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think what you've provided here is kind of a framework or a shell, you know, to work within and like sort of mine the, the various image content. And a, a few other questions I ask too are like, I, I get a, I try to get a sense of the process and the form. I would say, what was your feeling when you first woke up? And people will often say, well, I don't know. Well, think back and what do you think it was? Um, that tells you a lot too. If you wake up scared, mad, sweating, angry, or if you wake up happy, tells you a lot about the dream as well but that's a very fun pun <laughs> stare into the breast yeah that's very fun i just wanted to say thank you one more time to the stranger for their insightful comments about psychoanalysis and also the really good examples they gave to help us elucidate what is schizoanalysis 
If you would like to hear more from Inner Experience or Asset Horizon, come find us on Patreon or on Twitter. We have blogs. We have a community circle, people we interact with on Twitter. Also, we have a one-off reading group that we are going to do on Max Stirner for our patrons later this month. If you subscribe at the mid-tier or above, you can jump in and join that. Also, check out our blogs, check out our merch store, or just find us on Twitter and we can all interact there. Okay, we'll see you next time.